This is a story of the American spirit, of American heroes, men and women revealing their courage and commitment in a time of trial and challenge. They came together, united, to oppose a common threat to their homes, their families, their way of life, their future. This is a story from over two centuries ago when the freedoms we enjoy as Americans today were in doubt, our independence as a nation uncertain. American society was torn. Some favored independence. Others preferred the British crown. Still others took no side at all. The turmoil between factions was real and harsh. Neighbor against neighbor, families divided. And out of that circumstance arose men and women of action, men and women of the southern backcountry, Americans who made a difference, Americans who turned the tide of the Revolutionary War, and through that one act, change the course of world history. The story unfolds across the southern Appalachian Mountains and the Carolina Piedmont. The story is told today along the Overmountain Victory National Historic Trail lying in Virginia, Tennessee, North Carolina, and South Carolina. It is a story proudly told today by members of the Overmountain Victory Trail Association. To honor these heroes, the OVTA continues into its fifth decade, keeping the story alive. In the summer of 1780, as the American Revolution continued into its sixth year of fighting, the British were executing their southern strategy to tame the 13 rebellious colonies. After capturing Charlestown, South Carolina in May, Lieutenant General Lord Charles Cornwallis began marching north with an army of Loyalist Americans. As he moved through the center of South Carolina, his left flank to the west was protected by Major Patrick Ferguson. The Major, a Scotsman and an experienced and most capable soldier, was actively recruiting and training Loyalist militiamen from the backcountry and he was having rather good success in building an army of Americans ready to fight for the king and their rights as Englishmen. As Ferguson crossed the border into North Carolina in September, however, he was attacked by backcountry rebel militia fighting for independence. These frontiersmen included some of those from the settlements across the Appalachian Mountains in what is today's East Tennessee, but was then North Carolina. They were known as the Overmountain Men. These experienced hunters and Indian fighters came to harass Ferguson's forces. They skirmished with him, firing their long rifles from behind trees and rocks, and then retreated back across the Appalachians to safety beyond the mountains. Having quite had his fill of these irritating attacks, Major Ferguson released a captured Patriot militiaman from his camp at Gilberttown, North Carolina, to deliver an ominous message to those bothersome overmountain Patriots. If you do not desist your opposition to the British arms, I shall march this army over the mountains, hang your leaders, and lay your country waste with fire and sword. The messenger carrying Ferguson's warning soon crossed the Appalachian Mountains to arrive in the Holston River Valley at the home of Colonel Isaac Shelby. He lived at Sapling Grove in today's Bristol, Tennessee. The militia leader considered the bold threat and then mounted his horse riding 40 miles to confer with another militia leader, Colonel John Sevier, along the Nolichucky River. The two men talked for a day and then decided on what seemed the only reasonable course of action. They would turn the tables on the would-be hunter and make him the hunted. They would call out the Patriot militia and take the fight to Ferguson, pursuing him on the east side of the mountains before he could come over the Appalachians and into their homeland. The two militia leaders, Shelby and Severe, sent out messengers of their own to spread the word. The express riders rode deep into the vales and hollows of the mountains and to the homesteads along the rivers. Men such as Martin Gamble rode hard through the rough terrain, exhausting their horses and trading for fresh mounts where they could find them. 
They carried the word to the nearby settlements and to those farther away, to the Yadkin River Valley and across the Blue Ridge, to southwest Virginia along the Holston River. The message was simple and urgent. It was a call to arms, muster at Sycamore Shoals on September 25th. The Overmountain militiamen, readily heeding the call to arms, gathered in the fields of Sycamore Flats, spreading their individual campfires between the shoals of the river and Fort Watauga. Shelby brought 240 militiamen. Severe brought just as many. Colonels Charles McDowell and Andrew Hampton were already there from the North Carolina Piedmont. They had with them 160 of their Burke County and Rutherford County militiamen having ambushed Ferguson at Cane Creek in mid-September. And Colonel William Campbell brought 200 men from Abingdon, Virginia, after riding two days from their muster along Wolf Creek, not far from Black's Fort. Their horses splashed across the Watauga River, fording at Sycamore Shoals to hearty cheers from the men already there at Sycamore Shoals. Those gathered included more than just other militiamen. Families came along as well. They came to help prepare these men for their expedition across the mountains. Women came to help ready their husbands, brothers, sons, and fathers to go off to war. Children came along as did those too old to fight. Everyone helped as they could. Some offered food, others brought a rifle or a fowler or offered a horse to some militiamen who would otherwise have to walk. The community of Overmountain settlers provided what they could. They mended clothing and saddles, prepared food, molded musket balls, cleaned weapons. They groomed and shod horses. Mary Patton, a local powder maker, gave them 500 pounds of gunpowder. The families came together knowing that with the men going off, they would need to rely on each other for their own protection and survival. The farewells were anxious goodbyes, made with love and tears and hope, while swallowing back the uncertainty of ever seeing their loved ones again. As the men readied themselves to depart on September 26th, they gathered with the Reverend Samuel Doak for a blessing and a prayer. He gave them a message, and in it he gave them their battle cry, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. As the men then turned to begin their march, they were joined by another 200 Virginia militiamen from Montgomery County under the command of Colonel Arthur Campbell. He put the men under the command of his cousin, William Campbell, and then returned home where he and other militiamen would defend the lead mines near Fort Chiswell against raids by bands of loyalist Tories. With their spirits lifted by the number of armed men, then about 1,000, the band of militiamen marched out, some on horseback, some on foot. They drove alongside them a herd of beef cattle to provide them food for their campaign across the mountains. The cattle slowed them down so much that by noon they were only a few miles from Sycamore Shoals but they pressed on for the remainder of the day, reaching the Doe River at sunset. There they camped at an open and flat spot known as the resting place. That night, a light rain began to fall, so they stowed their precious gunpowder under a deep rock overhang to keep it dry. As dawn came on the second day of their expedition to pursue Major Patrick Ferguson, the officers knew the cattle would slow them too much going up the steep western side of the mountains. They ordered the men to spend the morning slaughtering a few head of cattle. The militiamen prepared for themselves a few days' rations, stuffing the cooked beef into their wallets and haversacks. And when that was eaten, these experienced woodsmen and hunters were expecting to live off the land as they needed. The militiamen ascended Yellow Mountain following a narrow pack horse trail called Bright's Trace. A thousand men, some on horses, some on foot, trod up this hillside, slipping on the wet ground and in the mud churned up by the horde of climbers, struggling in their moccasins, their shoes and their bare feet to reach the crest. 
At the top of Yellow Mountain Gap, they found themselves standing in snow described as shoe mouth deep. The officers paraded the men and had them fire their weapons. They also discovered that two men were missing, James Crawford and Samuel Chambers. These men had mustered under John Severe, but some who knew them suspected them of having loyalist leanings. It was feared the pair had run ahead to warn Patrick Ferguson that an army of a thousand militiamen was coming to attack him. The militia leaders had reason for concern, most certainly, and they could yet lose the element of surprise. But the Overmountain men had no choice but to continue their march. They descended the east side of Yellow Mountain along Roaring Creek and marched hard the next day along the North Toe River as it flowed southward through the plateau of the Blue Ridge to the mouth of Grassy Creek at today's Spruce Pine. They rode on with determination and purpose, yet remained uncertain of what ambush might lay ahead of them along the trail. After three days of crossing the Appalachian Mountains, the Overmountain men marched up Grassy Creek to the precipice of the Blue Ridge at Gillespie Gap. From there, they could see the broad expanse of the Catawba River Valley spreading out before them, and they had to make a choice. Two routes descended the eastern slope of the Blue Ridge Mountains. If they went down one and Ferguson by chance came up the other, he would then be behind them with no one to stop him marauding and plundering their homes as he had threatened to do. But the other choice was equally dangerous, to divide their numbers in the face of an equal enemy and to send smaller parties down the two paths was a classic military blunder. But that was the choice these brave men had to make. Campbell and the Virginians descended by the steep southern route to Turkey Cove. Shelby and Severe backtracked along Grassy Creek and circled around through a northern route to reach Hefner Gap, descending then into the North Catawba River Valley to camp at North Cove. Good fortune smiled on them all as both groups descended the mountain trails with neither encountering Ferguson. The two parties camped apart that night and then on September 30th reunited along the Catawba River. They marched together to Quaker Meadows at today's Morganton and to the homes of Patriot militia leaders and brothers, Colonel Charles McDowell and Major Joseph McDowell. At Quaker Meadows, the spirits of the Overmountain men were heartily lifted with the arrival of 350 more Patriot militiamen from Wilkes and Surrey counties in North Carolina's Yadkin River Valley. Some of these backcountry militiamen had mustered at Elkin Creek under Major Joseph Winston and marched three days up the Yadkin River. They were joined along the way by Colonel Benjamin Cleveland and the Wilkes County Militia, known as Cleveland's Bulldogs. Cleveland was an imposing figure at 300 pounds and known for his short temper. He had a reputation for hanging Tories and troublemakers as quickly as he could catch them. At Quaker Meadows, this band of Overmountain and backcountry Patriot militia then numbered about 1,400 men. That evening, the fields at Quaker Meadows were dotted with campfires as the men prepared their meals and warmed themselves in the evening's cool. The occasion was a chance to visit with good friends and to renew old acquaintances. Some of these men had fought alongside one another against the Cherokees and the Chickamaugas at the Battle of Long Island Flats and at the siege of Fort Watauga. Many of these men had gone together on Rutherford's expedition against the Cherokees during the summer of 76. Some of the men had patrolled together the more inhabited parts of North Carolina in the Yadkin and Catawba Valleys chasing down troublesome Tory militia, as well as marauding bands of opportunist outlaws. Around the multitude of campfires, the battle tested among the men regaled one another with stories of their exploits and adventures. The younger ones listened intently, hoping to learn something of what it might be like in a pitched fight 
and to prevail in a life and death struggle. They hoped to hear something from the stories then shared that night that would give them courage to call upon when it came their time to kill or be killed. The 1,400 Patriot militiamen marched out of Quaker Meadows on October 1st, heading south for Pilot Mountain, a distinctive rise on the horizon separated from the South Mountains. Beyond it, they would leave the Catawba River Valley and descend into the Broad River Valley, where they expected to find Patrick Ferguson at Gilbert Town, the small frontier settlement which the Loyalist leader had made his headquarters. At midday, it began to rain heavily and steadily. The Patriot officers stopped the march. The militiamen made camp at Bedford Hill, as none of the men had a tent making camp meant sheltering beneath the evergreen trees. The rain continued a second day. It was probably the remnants of a tropical storm blowing through. The officers again had the men remain in camp. These were not soldiers, men with a military discipline, with time on their hands and little to occupy their immediate attention. Some became anxious about the welfare of families they had left behind. These men were ready to get on with the business at hand and then get home. Their frustration boiled over. Tempers grew short. Some came nearly to blows. The officers met that night knowing they had to take action soon with Ferguson believed to be in Gilbert Town. They were all separate militia units and all of the leaders were colonels. They knew they would need a general commander if they were to be effective in battle. Charles McDowell offered to ride to Hillsborough to have a general assigned by General Horatio Gates to command them. But Isaac Shelby would have none of that. They were marching to surprise Ferguson, he reminded them, and they needed to keep moving. And even though he was the youngest of the colonels there at 29, he offered a suggestion. William Campbell, he said, had brought the most men and had come the farthest. But what Shelby knew clearly, but did not say, was that Campbell was the only colonel among them not from North Carolina. Selecting him would avoid the petty jealousies which would surely arise if any other colonel were given general command. The officers agreed. On the morning of October 3rd, as the Patriot militiamen prepared from their rain-soaked camp at Bedford Hill to march toward Gilbert Town, Colonels Benjamin Cleveland and Isaac Shelby addressed the men. Suspecting that some of the men had become anxious about their families back home, the two officers offered those who had changed their minds about the pursuit of Patrick Ferguson the opportunity to leave. They had only to take a step back. None would be thought less of for leaving. Not a man among them budged. The militiamen cheered themselves heartily for their bravery and their resolve. They then marched south, down winding wet Cane Creek, reaching and camping that night outside Gilbert Town. On October 4th, the Patriot militiamen entered Gilbert Town at today's Rutherford, North Carolina, only to discover that Major Ferguson and his Loyalist Army was no longer there. He had fled. The two spies, Crawford and Chambers, who had run ahead from Yellow Mountain Gap, had indeed found the Major and warned him about the horde of Patriot militiamen coming after him. By then, Ferguson was withdrawing from Gilbert Town and his advanced position on the North Carolina Piedmont. But the Patriot officers did not know where he had gone. Suspecting that Ferguson was headed to his former headquarters at 96, the Patriot officers proceeded to the southwest. 
They followed the suspected route of Ferguson, sending scouts ahead to confirm their suspicions. But late on the afternoon of October 5th, after reaching the ford at Green River, the Patriot militiamen realized they had lost Ferguson's trail completely. The men made camp that night in a most sullen and somber mood. They had crossed the mountains and chased him for 10 days, but Ferguson had escaped. As the Patriot militiamen considered their loss of Ferguson's trail, some 20 miles northeast of the ford at Green River, 270 South Carolina militiamen under Colonels William Hill and Edward Lacey were along the Broad River in North Carolina near Flint Hill. They were then refugees from their own state in the face of Cornwallis's continuing march toward Charlottetown. These South Carolinians had received word that the Overmountain men and the backcountry militia were on the march. These South Carolinians were heading west, attempting to join them. On the evening of October 5th, South Carolina militia scouts reported to Colonels Hill and Lacey that Patrick Ferguson was headed east toward Charlottetown, not south toward 96. The two officers knew they had to get word of this to the backcountry militiamen they hoped to join. Colonel Lacey volunteered to ride into the night to find them. He was in unfamiliar countryside and left in the dark with a local guide. They rode for hours, getting thoroughly lost. At times, Lacey suspected his guide was misleading him on purpose and twice pulled his pistol to dispatch the fellow, but he held his fire. With good fortune before dawn on October 6th, South Carolina Militia Colonel Edward Lacey came upon the Patriot Militia Sentry. These Overmountain and Yadkin Valley Militia officers did not know this South Carolina Militia leader, but through his own demeanor and character, he was able to convince these Virginia and North Carolina officers that he brought them reliable information. The officers agreed to meet up with the South Carolinians at the end of the next day at a designated spot. Lacey then rode back another 20 miles to alert his South Carolina militiamen. The leaders at Green River Ford knew they could never cover that distance at their current pace. They divided their forces, telling those with horses to be ready to ride at sunup. The mounted militiamen departed at dawn following a ridge road across the South Carolina border, covering 21 miles. Some of the officers were so eager to go that they gave up command of their militiamen on foot to join in with the mounted party. The foot soldiers followed along behind them at a quickened pace. All were headed for the cow pen. On the evening of October 6th, the separate militia groups, the backcountry patriots and the South Carolina militiamen, arrived at the cow pens near sunset. They were joined by some 80 of the South Fork boys of Lincoln County and by about 30 Georgia militiamen. The cow pens was a place settlers brought their cattle to fatten them before market. As it was the home of a loyalist cattle merchant, 
The Patriot militiamen slaughtered a few of the merchants' cattle and prepared their first good meal in days, harvesting acres of corn for themselves and their horses. Soon, another South Carolina militia scout returned to the camp. He was Joseph Carr, a man with a handicap of some sort since birth, which enabled him to disarm the suspicions of others. Pretending to be a loyalist, he had visited Ferguson's camp some miles away at Tate's plantation. Joseph Carr had learned of Ferguson's plans and then faded into the shadows of the woods surrounding the camp and as well from the attention of the loyalist. He mounted his horse and rode into the night, looking for his company of South Carolina militia to give them the news. Discovering his fellow South Carolina militiamen at the cowpens, Scout Joseph Carr revealed to the officers that Ferguson was headed toward Charlottetown on a road by way of King's Mountain. The Patriot officers quickly realized that they had to catch up to Ferguson before he got any closer to Charlottetown and the protection of Cornwallis's larger army. But Ferguson was still 35 miles away. If they were to catch him, they would have to ride all night and would need to move quickly. The militiamen chose the 900 best marksmen and put them on the 900 sturdiest horses. At 9 o'clock that night of October 6th, after having ridden 21 miles just that day, and after being in pursuit of Ferguson's loyalist force for two weeks across 200 miles of wilderness, they rode out into a dark, cold October night. They departed quickly. Some of the men did not eat, and then it began to rain. They took off their hunting frocks and wrapped them around their rifles to keep their powder dry and their weapons ready to fire. They rode on, intent that this time, Ferguson would not escape. The militiamen, rain-soaked and weary and riding all night from the cow pens, reached the broad river near dawn. Suspecting a possible ambush on the other side, they rode downstream to cross at the Cherokee Ford on the morning of October 7th. The night's rain had caused the river to rise and the strong currents to swirl, but all the men got across. Not a man took a ducking. Across the river, the men rode on. The rain soon stopped, and the sun breaking through thinning clouds helped dry out the drenched militiamen. Along the way, they learned of Ferguson's camp. He is on that hill, declared one young woman, pointing in the direction of Little King's Mountain. The day before, on October 6th, British Major Patrick Ferguson had stopped his march toward Charlottetown and made his camp at Little King's Mountain. It was a small promontory about 60 feet higher than the surrounding ground, an elevation that he surmised gave him the advantage in a defensible position. He circled his supply wagons but raised no other defenses. As the rain began to fall that evening, a confident Major Patrick Ferguson, only a day away from Charlottetown, may have taken some comfort in the company of Virginia Paul and Virginia Sal Two good-looking women, it was reported, supposed to be his mistresses, but serving nominally as his cooks. <laughs> William Campbell and the Patriot militiamen rode on, getting closer to Little King's Mountain. The rain had worked to their advantage, dampening the sound of the horses' hooves, and preventing them from raising a telltale cloud of dust as they approached. As they reached the west end of the rise on which Ferguson was camped, the militiamen stopped and dismounted. They tied up their horses, leaving behind their blankets and their hunting frocks, and taking with them only what they would need in battle, their rifles, their powder, their shot, their tomahawks, and their hunting knives. The general command went out, Put fresh prime in your rifles, boys, and every man go into battle resolved to fight until he dies. 
They broke into two columns and began to encircle the mountain, still unnoticed by the loyalists encamped on top. Every man took his position and faced the hill. The Patriot militiamen were first spotted by the Loyalist sentries as the Patriots started up the hill. Ferguson quickly mounted his horse and with shrill signals from his two silver whistles called his Loyalist militia into formation. The advancing Patriot militia fired their hunting rifles with accuracy, taking a toll with every shot but requiring precious time to reload. The Loyalists returned fire with their muskets, inaccurate as they were in a skirmish such as this, but quickly reloaded and fired again. All sides of the mountain were soon shrouded in a thickening haze of gunpowder smoke. With the Patriot militiamen paused behind trees to reload their rifles, the Loyalists mounted a bayonet charge, forcing the Patriots to retreat to the bottom of the hill in the face of cold steel. But courage took hold. The over-mountain and backcountry Patriots from Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia turned around and again faced the mountain taking cover as they moved up the slope from tree to rock to tree, recovering the hillside as the Loyalists retreated to the crest. But a second bayonet charge by Ferguson's troops again forced the Patriot riflemen to retreat. Once again, brave and determined, the Patriots would not be denied. They remounted their attack, each man advancing under his own command, each fighting with courage and skill and commitment, and in time, together, taking the crest of Little King's Mountain. As Major Ferguson tried to ride his horse through the ever-tightening circle of Patriot militiamen, more than a few rifles fired at him, and the Major fell from his saddle, mortally wounded. The despised Patrick Ferguson was dragged around the hilltop by his panicked horse, a foot caught in the stirrup. The officer, second in command, quickly called for quarters and surrendered. William Campbell, other militia officers, and a host of backcountry Patriot militiamen surrounded the Loyalist army they had just soundly defeated. The hour-long battle was done. Around the hillside, the price of victory was dear. South Carolina militia Colonel James Williams lay mortally wounded near the crest. Patriots, including officers, lay dead, others dying. Some shot, some stabbed with bayonets. The wounded called out for water. The uninjured looked anxiously for missing family members. The horrors of war surrounded them. The toll among the loyalists was much greater and the calls from some of their wounded for help went unheeded by the victorious patriots. Each side tended its own, but the only doctor on the field, a loyalist, Dr. Johnson, tended to them all. Soon after the roar of gunfire had stopped, 
local women arrive to help care for the wounded and to console the dying. Burials were hastily and poorly done in shallow graves with bodies covered by stones and logs and sheets of tree bark, offering scant discouragement to a host of wild animals which would feed on the remains of the deceased. Wounded patriots were carried off in slings between horses. The wounded loyalists were left to their own care or to die. Atop King's Mountain, the patriots rolled the captured wagons over the campfires and burned the loyalist supplies. The prisoners were forced to march along, each carrying a musket or two without flints, the spoils of war. The victors marched away on October 8th, hurriedly, anxious that other detachments of Cornwallis's loyalist army might soon appear. When General Lord Cornwallis learned after a few days that Major Ferguson was dead, and that all the left flank of his advancing army had been killed or captured, Cornwallis retreated from Charlottetown for the winter. The most powerful army in the world had been forced into retreat by these backcountry militiamen of the southern colonies, these despised backwater men, these frontier rabble. Thomas Jefferson would later call the Battle of King's Mountain that joyful annunciation of the turn of the tide of success in the Revolutionary War. The American Revolution would continue for another year, of course, with Cornwallis' surrender at Yorktown coming just 12 months and 12 days after this surprising Patriot victory in the back country. And some of these men who fought at King's Mountain would fight yet again but in the days after the battle, many of the Overmountain Patriots were not spoiling for another fight soon. They made their way back home to their families and their fields. They reunited with their communities. They had gotten the victory they wanted. The much despised Major Patrick Ferguson was dead, and so was his threat to lay waste their country with fire and sword. For the moment, their homeland was safe. To learn more about this remarkable episode in America's story, visit Kings Mountain National Military Park and the Overmountain Victory National Historic Trail. Both are units of the National Park Service. You can also read many good books, including Before They Were Heroes at Kings Mountain by Randall Jones. And please show your support for sharing this part of our nation's history by joining the OVTA, the Overmountain Victory Trail Association, at www.ovta.org. Together, we are keeping the story alive.